You've probably already heard the traditional advice around listening better, to paraphrase, summarizing what the other person said, mirroring their body language. But there's a lot beyond that. On this episode, how to get better at deep listening. This is Coaching for Leaders, episode 408. Produced by Innovate Learning, maximizing human potential. Greetings to you from Orange County, California. This is Coaching for Leaders, and I'm your host, Dave Stahoviak. Leaders aren't born, they're made. And this weekly show helps you discover leadership wisdom through insightful conversations. And speaking of insightful conversations, one of the key elements, of course, is our ability to practice listening. Not only listening, but deep listening. Today's guest is going to help us to take this step to become a more effective listener and to inspire us with some key strategies that will help us to take that next step. I am glad to welcome to the show today, Oscar Tromboli. Oscar is a mentor, coach, speaker, and author. He was a director at Microsoft for over a decade. During his time there, he headed up the Microsoft Office division in Australia and also created what became known as Microsoft Protege, a talent development program for undergraduates looking for work at Microsoft. Today, he works with leadership teams and their organizations on the importance of clarity to create change, how to embrace the digital economy, and the role values play in the achievement of your purpose. He is the author of Deep Listening, Impact Beyond Words. Oscar, so glad to meet you. G'day, Dave. I'm looking forward to listening to you and speaking to you today. Yeah, well, in addition to our conversation about deep listening, you've been a longtime listener of the show as well. So thank you so much for supporting the show. And as I was thinking about our conversation, I actually pulled up a quote from a Jane Austen book, Persuasion. And in that book, Anne and Mr. Elliot are having a conversation. And it goes like this. My idea of good company is the company of clever, well-informed people who have a great deal of conversation. That is what I call good company. You are mistaken, he said gently. That is not good company. That is the best. That captures for me, when I think about conversation, it it really is something we all aspire to, isn't it? I think most of us want to be heard, but what we crave is that people will actually listen to us. And, And listen to us in a way that they not only hear us, but they see us. And not only do they see us, but they see what we mean. So the highest level of listening is your ability to listen beyond the words, beyond what's said, and listen to what the person who's speaking to you is actually trying to mean. Because for most of us, it's a rare experience that someone will take the time to listen well beyond the words and start to listen to meaning. Yet when we do, the connection is amazing. The impact is extraordinary. The productivity hack of the 20th century was the world and its leaders being taught how to speak persuasively or talk with influence. But I think the leadership hack of the 21st century is listening because we spend 55% of our day listening. And the more senior you are, the more listening you'll do. So if you're in an executive role, an owner or or on the executive team or even on the board of directors of an organization, you're listening up to 80% of the time. But whether we look at the global financial crisis of 2008 or we look at the Deepwater Horizons disaster in 2012 where BP, they're still counting the cost at $53 billion, a couple of really good examples of not listening taking place there. So my obsession every day is to make transparent to leaders the commercial cost of not listening. One thing I'm wondering is, as you've done this work around listening, what is different about those moments, those rare times when we really do feel like we've been heard? The question that the listener poses in those rare moments where you feel heard is not to educate the listener, but to help the speaker understand their thinking a bit more. So I'll I'll give you a really simple mathematical example, and it comes from the neuroscience of your brain. 
So you speak at between 125 at the low end. So I'm a slow speaker, so that's where I speak at. On average, most people would speak at about 150 words a minute. Yet in their mind, they can think at up to 900 words a minute. So your mind ha is like a washing machine in wash cycle. It's got all these words going around and it's quite messy and it's quite sudsy and it's quite agitated in your head. So when you say the first thing that comes out of your mouth, there's a one in nine chance that what you're saying is actually what you mean. So that's about 11%. Dave, so I don't know about you, but if you had an 11% chance of surviving a surgery, you'd probably ask for a second opinion. And yeah, in those indeed. moments where we get asked a question that helps reveal something about us rather than the extraordinary intellect of the questioner or the interrogator, they will go and explore the next thing that you're thinking about as the speaker. And it's often not a content-based question. The question that helps us all get a little bit further in understanding our own thinking is, tell me more. Or it could be, what else are you thinking about then? Or how long have you been thinking about that? And then these magic code words come out, Dave. The, the magic code words includes words like, well, actually, what I meant to say was, or they'll say, and, and it's typically preceded by a significant sigh. And I'll say something like, you know what really matters to me? Or they'll say something like, what's really critical in this conversation? Or they'll say, what we haven't covered off is, and all these code words are helping the speaker explore those extra 800 words that are stuck in their head. Now, every washing machine has got a rinse cycle and it's got a wash cycle. And for a human, the rinse cycle is when we speak. We're rinsing our brain out for what we're thinking about. And yet on a washing machine, we have two, three, sometimes four rinse cycles to get the clothes completely washed. And yet none of us ask for a second opinion or a second rinse cycle in most conversations we assume that the very first thing a speaker has said is actually what they mean. And we've already said, mathematically, you've got a one in nine chance that what they say is what they mean. If you love taking high odds, keep the conversation going. But what's likely to happen is you're gonna revisit that conversation one, two, three weeks down the track, rather than just taking just an extra bit of time to ask the question, and what else? I'm curious what else you're thinking about on this topic. And that will start to help the speaker explore their thinking a little bit more. It's rare for us to explore our own thinking, let alone somebody to create a space and place to do this. It was really interesting in about 2006, uh, a Microsoft executive came to Australia, Peter, and he flew from Seattle. It's about a 24 hour flight. And I was sitting down with him hosting 10 local CEOs. And he was at the head of the table. And imagine someone who's come in from the airport, about a 25 minute ride into the CBD of Sydney, into quite a palatial hotel. And everybody had name tags sitting on these tables, all very influential in the marketplace. And Peter sat down, everybody had been pre-briefed by me, so they knew who he was and we were ready to go. But in that moment, Peter did something really interesting. Now, Peter runs an organization, well, he did in those days, of about 55,000 people, about $10 billion in revenue, so not an insignificant kind of business. And just as he sat down, he paused, he stood up, he apologized to the room and he said, look, I'm really sorry. He took out his cell phone from his waistcoat pocket, switched it off, stepped over to his bag at the side of the room and then came back to the middle of the room. Now, Dave, what do you think happened with the other 10 CEOs in the room in that moment? Probably some of them switched off their phones too. <laughs> Yeah. So seven out of 10 switch their phones off and put them in their bags. And, and I'm guessing the other three probably put it into flight mode or maybe to silent or something like that. And 
the meeting continued, but the level of engagement was extraordinary. And when Peter left at about the 45 minute mark to go to his next meeting and picked up by his next host, we did a quick debrief with the room. And what they reflected on was everybody had a chance to contribute and we all had a chance to listen to a wide range of perspectives. Now, I don't know about you, Dave, but for a lot of leaders that I work with, they're going back to back from meeting room to meeting room. They're carrying laptops, they're carrying iPads, they're carrying cell phones, they're carrying notes and files from previous meetings, and they're just not ready to listen. A lot of the listening literature says get fixated on the speaker, but to be a great listener, you have to listen to yourself first and you have to create a space and place where you're available to listen. That meeting with those 10 executives really transformed the way Microsoft did business in our local marketplace in the division I ran probably for the next five years because they had real conversations. They weren't superficial. They weren't conversations that were distracted. So the question I pose to leaders who are listening right now, what are you doing to role model listening? And more importantly, what are you doing to role model being present for the person you're listening to so you can be completely focused? I'm really curious about the meeting you mentioned, because my sense is a lot of folks in our audience have, if not been themselves in that situation, have certainly attended meetings where a person of some influence or either with their organization or with the customer has shown up in a meeting. And oftentimes those are very rushed, very scripted events. And as you pointed out, the people there really appreciated that they really got to be present. And I'm, I'm so curious, what did he do? What did you do? What did the room do? How did that happen? How did that invitation start? Yeah, it's again, it's all about role modeling and Peter just opened up and said, look, I can bring you the stone tablets from Seattle, from Redmond, and tell you what we think our view of the world is. But what I'm more curious about is what are you struggling with in this market and what do we need to change to help you? So immediately his orientation moved from him and his organization to them and their struggles. And what that did was allow people to discuss openly not only what issues were common to them. So Peter could go, well, okay, four people have mentioned that issue consistently. So that's probably a market size issue. But Peter never sought to solve any of the problems in the meeting. And I think that's another easy place for leaders to fall into is to get into fix mode rather than continue to be a little bit more curious and explore a little bit more further. And he just kept prompting to say, you know, tell me a little bit more about the implication of that. How does that play out for your customers? So what he had was a really good telescope out to the externality, to the marketplace. For a lot of leaders, they're very internally orientated. It's about their P&L or it's about their cost model or it's about their business model. And, and Peter just kept coming back to, and what does that mean for our customers? Because we both shared common customers and it was in asking them and ex getting them to explore that through not only their own lens, but the customer lens that allowed the room to find commonality because not everyone's organization was the same size or they had similar capabilities. But once the customer was mentioned in the conversation, you could see the, the people nodding their heads and, and acknowledging, yeah, that's what we hear from our customers too. I think that's the externality and the questioning orientation where, where Peter wasn't looking to solve, Dave. I'd say that's the big difference. And I also hear you saying, especially at the executive level, that it's setting aside that time to listen. And then if I further that thought and that being an effective experience, that there probably was also some time he had to set aside later to make sure he followed up. And my sense is amongst many executives is, you know, there's the hour long meeting and we're going to listen, problem solve, brainstorm, make decisions and solve every issue in the hour. And I'm hearing something different from what you're saying is that this meeting, this was a time to listen. And then my guess is there was also a time later that was already set aside and blocked out, or maybe he did that intentionally to then process what was heard 
and do something with what was heard. A simple rule of thumb is for every hour you invest in listening, you need to invest another hour in the action plan. So the amount of time should be equated because hearing is one thing. Action is the distinction between hearing and listening. If you act on what I say you're doing, then I believe that you actually listen to me. Nothing frustrates employees more than their annual engagement survey. This is a beautiful example of a waste of time when it comes to listening because most people in employee engagement surveys probably say exactly the same thing they said last year and the year before and get frustrated because nothing actually happens. I was speaking to about 300 human resources and people and culture leaders uh, over the last three months on a roadshow with a software company that creates employee engagement software. How do we listen? And I said, look, this is going to be completely controversial, but please stop surveying your staff. Please stop sending emails and cheerleading why filling in the survey is really important and just action what they've said in the last employee engagement survey. Because if you do, you'll never have to send out another email saying, please give us feedback because they'll want to give you feedback because you've taken action. So it's a one-to-one ratio, Dave. For every hour, half hour you're investing, in listening, you need to invest the same amount of time in the action plan. Now, for a leader, that doesn't mean they're investing their time into that action plan. So for Peter, he only took one action from the meeting and that was delegated to me. And that was done in the moment. So he turned to me and he said, Oscar, I'm going to ask Alan, who was one of the executives in the room, to summarize what his ask is on behalf of the room. And Alan explained something in regard to how do we train people in more modern technologies. And Peter said, if I'm coming back in a year, how will I know it's different, Alan? And he said, it would be different because we've trained 80 staff in these more modern technologies. And he turned to me and he says, okay, Oscar, that's all we need to worry about. If we do that, and he turned to the room, if we do that, Will that make an impact for everybody here? And the answer was yes. So I think as a skillful executive, one of the most critical things you want to do is make sure that you can action during the meeting rather than having all this follow-up. So for me, my work with Peter from that point on was really monitor and report and make sure that we were tracking to that. That extra hour was my action, not his. Got it, got it. So depending on the roles we find ourselves in within the organization, the person doing the action may change. The key is that the action happens regardless. And and you've you've hit on something that I've heard as a big complaint for a lot of the culture and engagement surveys as well, is that, you know, we've we've surveyed our people to death. (laughs) And usually it's the employees who are saying this at at the Mm. uh, at the individual contributor level. And they'll say, you know, we all know what the numbers are, and yet we don't really see a lot of action from the organization to really do anything substantially that's made it different. And the reminder here from you is well taken that, yes, listen well and (laughs) listen with purpose to then take some action to do something that will then demonstrate to people that you've heard and you care. Yeah. And that should be coming out in regular town hall meetings, in manager one-on-ones. It should be on the leadership agenda every month that that part of the plan is being actioned. I was poking around on your website and one of the things I noticed that one of your clients had said is, you ask the question that needs to be asked. And I'm curious, where does the bravery come for you to ask the question that needs to be asked? So for me, I don't think it's about bravery. My orientation always is what's going to help the room rather than me. So I'm not doing it through a lens of bravery. I think I sense not just what's said, but what's unsaid and the group connection around that. And I kind of speak to what's not spoken. Uh, One of my favorite conversations I always have with people is about the undiscussable in the room. And the reality is that the undiscussable is always discussed. 
just not in the room that can fix it. And I'm very privileged that I get to sit in the room that can normally allocate the resources to get it solved. I don't think the room can always fix it, but they can command the resources and direct resources to get the outcome. So I don't think it's about me, specifically, Dave, my bravery or my courage. It's the fact that I sit in a place and space where these leaders can come to a realization that they can create the change. And if I can speak to the undiscussable, the elephant in the room, I just try and give voice to that. And I think how it's heard is Oscar asks the questions that need to be asked. And it's not just asking the question too. I think asking the question is actually probably not even courageous. It, it may be the opposite of that. I think the courageous bit is holding the tension in the room through the use of silence and continuous questioning to hold the room accountable to go, have we fully explored everything on this question? Because typically people will, they will brush it off initially if you bring up that undiscussable. Our company is always like that. Oscar, that's just the way things get done here. And I always pose back to them, is that the choice you want to make going forward? And in that moment, you can literally see everybody looking at each other. But again, I just hold, the, hold that space and create enough tension in the room so it becomes uncomfortable that it needs to be discussed. It needs to be explored. And for me, the cost of not discussing it is way too big. For it not to be discussed and that's the bit that i will always have the presence to hold the leadership team to that moment in time not because my question's courageous but holding the space and not letting them off the hook there's a nobody else that will do that so in that moment it's my responsibility to be the advocate for the hundreds or thousands of people that this leadership team represents so i see it as a privilege but equally, I see it as a responsibility. And quite often, that's what people will comment the most, that how did you even hear that? But done well, listening deeply, it's not about you. It's about them and their discovery. So there's two stories that kind of bring that to life. I mean, the first story, I was facilitating a group of 12 people in a very narrow, dusty boardroom where the air conditioning wasn't working great. And it was an organization that was enjoying 30% growth for the last four years of its running. They had about 500 employees in their organization. They were a national organization, but things had started to flatten out and things weren't, weren't working as well. So we were in a room and we were just before lunch and the CEO was giving me kind of, if he was a superhero, he'd have these like laser lights going from his eyes to mine going, hurry up. <laughs> get this thing finished. And we were doing a very practical thing, which is a group-based exercise to help listen at the level of meaning. And I, and I simply asked, invited the group to talk about what animal this organization currently was, what characteristics of an animal did this organization have? Were they below the ground? Were they below the water? Were they on the land? Were they in the air? Were they a mythical creature? And as we asked around the room, we kept moving around and we went into this almost group think where everybody in the room talked about an eagle, an osprey, a seagull. They were all fast moving birds of prey and they all swooped and they were all agile and they were all elegant. And there was one person who hadn't spoken. And I don't know about you, Dave, I'm a I'm a card carrying member of the introvert community. And when, <laughs> when, when you go to an event and they go, Hey, put your hand up if you're an extrovert and put your hand up if you're an introvert and kind of, they divide the room up. I'm sitting there going, if I'm really an introvert, I'm definitely not putting my hand up. I don't want to be known as an introvert. <laughs> so I, I was I looking <laughs> at Elaine who I reckon was also a card carrying member of the introvert community on this leadership team. And she hadn't spoken. And one of the things we don't do well as leaders is hear all the opinions in the room. We hear the loudest opinions. 
or we hear the people with the opinions that they're most passionate about. And I didn't even ask Elaine. I just looked at her. I opened my left palm out and kind of signaled in her direction. And the leader in the room caught my eye again with his laser-like vision bearing into my head going, I want lunch. Can we get on with it? Do we really need to hear from her? And I just looked at her and held the pause just longer than was comfortable for her. And Elaine said, I have a different animal in mind. And I didn't say anything again. I just invited her with my own eyes and my open palm. And she said, isn't it obvious to everybody we're a snake? Hmm. The tension in the room went up. You could have heard a pin drop. Dave, when we talk about snakes, what are the characteristics that are going through your head right now when we talk about the snake? Oh, gosh. Uh, uh, slimy, uh, slithering, um, uh, yeah, deceptive, so, uh, you know, um, yeah. attack, those kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. And Elaine was from a culture that wasn't the dominant culture in the room. Elaine was from Asia. And she continued and she said, we are like a snake. We shed our skin every season and adapt ourselves to serve our clients the best. We've forgotten how to shed our skin. And you could hear the air come back into the room. And everybody in that moment, the meaning was created. And the CEO's face and body posture changed. And everybody in the room just faced Elaine. And she had the confidence at that point to kind of go into a plan and go, you know, we could make snakes into our product code names. We could use snakes in our sales presentations. And I think if we shed our skin at the appropriate time for our clients, then we shed our skins to look after them rather than worrying about us. Mm. And in that, in that moment where we, we saw her have the courage to speak what was on her mind, that point changed. Now, I'm still working with that organization and that CEO with a laser-like vision is still enjoying about 30% growth, but he talked about that as an inflection on their, on their sigmoid curve or their S curve of their growth because they took the time to listen to somebody that they normally wouldn't listen to. The last story is a story about a manufacturing company where I was speaking to a group of people managers, about 70 of them in the room, and the CEO was off to the side, and I talked about all the levels of listening but halfway through that presentation, I could just sense the energy in the room wasn't right. Dave, you know this, you'll walk into some organizations and the tension's there from the get-go. Yeah. And I turned to the CEO off stage right from me and I said, look, I'm just going to do something off script, Mark. Um, do you trust me? And he looked at me and shrugged like, do I have a choice? And in that moment, I went, well, I'm taking a big risk. Uh, maybe I won't get paid. Who knows what will happen? But I turned to the room and I just said, hey, with the person next to you, just talk to each other and tell each other what movie you guys are living right now on this site. Now, the backstory is it's a site that has sterile manufacturing. And they had an issue in one of the pipelines where there was an impurity, which meant that massive amounts of stock were being held up because quality wasn't sure that the production batch was sterile. And as a result, there was millions and millions of dollars stuck in stock and they'd solve the problem month after month and then the problem would come back. Anyway, I invited the room to come back and said, what, what movies, what movies, what movies? And again, the CEO to the right of me was kind of going, where are the heck are you going with this, Oscar? Yeah. And, and they all came back, Die Hard with a Vengeance, The Titanic, The Tower in Inferno. They were all disaster movies. And this movie gave everybody permission to actually tell the truth about what's going on. And in that moment, Mark stormed up to the stage, took the hand mic off me, turned to the room and said, I'm really sorry. He turned to me and said, Oscar, it's taken you 35 minutes to put your finger on something I haven't been able to put my finger on for three months. He turned to the room and said, I need your help. I don't know how to solve this, but I'm committed to listening to you. Nobody wants to turn up and work in a disaster movie every day. 
how can we work together to solve this? And the session moved completely away from whatever I was talking about, and they got into a, a dialogue about the barriers. Now, something that was taking three months got solved in three days because people had permission to tell the truth and speak to their meaning. In the past, it's a heavily, you can imagine this is a very heavy engineering environment. Everybody was talking about Six Sigma and root cause analysis and five whys and how they were going to solve this, but nobody was actually listening to each other. They were just talking over each other and everybody thought their answer to solving the problem was the most sustainable in the longest term. And they kept coming back with this problem. But in asking the group to talk about a movie, we gave them a permission slip to say something out aloud that they normally wouldn't say. And in saying it was a disaster movie, it created a space and place for the leader to stand up. And to be honest, it was a very brave step for him to admit he was wrong. But the payoff was extraordinary, something that was taking them three months and not solving. They solved in three days because they made a commitment to listen to each other rather than talk over the top of each other. So whether it's a lane and a snake or a disaster movie, listening can quickly transform if you're listening at a level of depth and at a level of color, rather than just listening to what's obvious, which is typically words and content. You've made the invitation for us to explore and one of the resources you've made available is some of the listening myths that you've posted on your website, which dive in on some of the details of things we've learned in the past, many of us about listening that may or may not really reflect the kind of listeners we'd like to be. And so for folks who'd like to dive in more on this, uh, we're obviously just scratching the surface of your work. Tell us more about that. And I'm going to, of course, include it in our weekly leadership guide as well. Yeah, so if you visit oscartrimboli.com forward slash listening myths, we unpack the five most common myths about listening, but more importantly, what to do about them. There's practical tips for each of the five myths and how to just step forward and, and make something that is unknown known. And once you're aware of the change, how do you make the change impactful? And, you know, one of the best business books of the last decade ever published was published in October last year by James Clear, Atomic Habits, and how do you make change sustainable? And one of the things he said is you have to adopt an identity of the thing you're looking to become. So rather than I want to lose weight, I want to be an energized athlete is a different way to think about it. And if I'm an energized athlete, I have a completely different perspective on the way I exercise and have food. And the same is true when it comes to listening. Move from being a distracted listener to a deep and powerful listener so you can have an impact beyond words. And these five myths will help you on the stepping stone to that, Dave. As you've gone around the world teaching people about listening, in the last few years, Oscar, what have you changed your mind on? When listening isn't productive, too much listening is just as destructive as not enough listening. And in our Australian way of saying it, it's like we, we need to do it, not just talk about it. And so the big thing that I've changed my mind on is when is listening too much? When is listening not productive? I came in as I started this journey about five years ago full time, but I've probably been doing it for 15 years. If you go back in my history and the kinds of things I was doing at Microsoft, I always thought listening is always the right thing to do. Adam Grant recently interviewed Melinda Gates from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And the topic was about when your strength is overplayed. And Melinda said she's an extraordinary listener, but she realized there are points in time where you have to speak up. And listening too much and not speaking your truth is a really critical learning that I've had for me personally in my journey. So for me, too much of my time has probably been spent listening. And only in the last 12 months have I had the courage to start to speak about the topic of listening. So for someone who spends 93% of their day listening, it's a real struggle for me to get in front of a mic or stand up in front of a thousand people to talk on the topic of listening. But that's the action I need to take. And that's the learning I've made 
that listening by itself is pointless without action. And that's the change for me in the last 12 months, Dave. Oscar Trimboli, author of Deep Listening, Impact Beyond Words. Oscar, thanks so much for challenging all of us to listen more for meaning. Thank you for your time. Thanks for listening. Several related episodes to today's conversation with Oscar. Uh, one of them is episode 238, How to Be a Nonconformist with Adam Grant. Oscar mentioned Adam during our conversation, and uh, Adam has done tremendous work for leaders and, and really folks at every level of organizations on how to be more effective at building relationships, of starting businesses, and so much more. Episode 238 is a great inspiration, especially if you're thinking about how to start something new. Uh, he challenges some of the traditional myths that many of us believe in when we think of starting new ideas and entrepreneurship. Uh, it's a fascinating conversation, episode 238. Also helpful to you will be episode 376, How to Become the Person You Want to Be with James Clear. Oscar also mentioned uh, his book, Atomic Habits, and I'm in full agreement. Uh, that book really is just a tremendous game changer in how we think about becoming the people we want to be and changing our behavior and specifically around creating new identities versus just setting goals. In fact, we've incorporated some of that thinking into how we set commitments within our academy and thinking about things through identity and not just goal setting. Uh, if that is something that's of interest to you, episode 376 will be a great starting point uh, for you as well. And then finally, I recommend episode 271, how to increase your conversational intelligence with my guest, Judith Glazer. Two reasons I'm recommending this episode today. First of all, it is a fabulous compliment to today's conversation with Oscar. And Judith and I talked in detail about conversations, not just the listening piece, but the speaking piece, really being present with the other person. If you found this conversation useful, uh, that's just a wonderful place to continue the journey of thinking about how to engage in really a deep and meaningful conversation. The other reason I'm mentioning it is a longtime listeners will remember uh, when Judith was on the show, she talked about her battle with cancer, and it was a wonderful news at the time that she was in remission. Unfortunately, I heard the news not long ago that her cancer had returned, and late last year, she lost her battle with cancer. When that episode aired, uh, a number of you reached out to me and shared how impactful Judith's work had been to you. Uh, many of you uh, knew her better than I ever did. I only had the single conversation with her on the episode. And yet I recall from that conversation how beautiful her work was and is and how she was just able to step into a place uh, clearly of uh, wanting to serve people so well and had dedicated her life's work to helping people to really build and develop great conversations. It is a wonderful inspiration to you as well. If you haven't heard it, please uh, take a moment to check out episode 271, How to Increase Your Conversational Intelligence. And thank you, Judith, for the fabulous work you did and the love you brought for people in connecting better with each other. My invitation also to you, if you haven't already, is to step over to the website, coachingforleaders.com, and you can search out all of those past episodes, plus so many more. You'll see this episode under the topics of personal leadership, conversation, and coaching skills. There are many more conversations we've had over the years that will relate to those. And if you are on the journey of getting better at any of these areas, that will be useful to you. You can activate your free membership right over at coachingforleaders.com and it will give you access to a whole bunch of things, including my free 10 day audio course, 10 ways to empower the people you lead. If you'll give me just 10 minutes a day for 10 days, it'll help you to get the most immediate practical actions to become a better leader. Plus, insight on some of the most useful conversations from the show over the last eight years now. You can activate that by going over to coachingforleaders.com. When you do and set up your free membership, it'll also give you access to my weekly leadership guide that comes every Wednesday. That'll include all the links I've just mentioned and also all the resources I found that will help support your leadership development between shows. Have a fantastic week, and I look forward to seeing you back next Monday. Take care.